Welcome to another episode of Biohacking Your Pain. And today we have a very special guest joining us who is the author of the Knee Pain Bible, a self-care guide to eliminating knee pain and returning to the movements that you love. Uh, he has a number of different endorsements, but a few that really ring and uh, are indicative of his capabilities and what we're going to talk about today is in the foreword of his book, uh, there's an NFL wide receiver who talks about having a partial ACL tear. And he says, if they tell you that you'll just have to live with pain, know that this book and these methods can be your saving grace just like mine. A number of different reviews that talk about his ability are the best part is that he identifies why injuries that feel like they are specific to one part of the body can be caused by more systematic global issues than you would suspect. So today I have with me Chris, the author mm -hmm. of the Knee Pain Bible. Thank you so much for joining us. That, it's my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. So, you know, I was reading through your book and it just really just took me back as something that would be useful for a whole host of people from athletes to those people who want to try to be able to get to that peak performance level and their weekend warriors or those people who have pain that has been really limiting in them. You know, when we talk about, you know, who is the audience for this book, who did you write it for originally? I wrote it for the common person. Um, you know, I mean, I, I woke up for, at the age of 14 one day with knee pain, playing basketball. I couldn't go upstairs. I couldn't go downstairs. I mean, my knees hurt tremendously. My mom took me to the doc, three different doctors and they all took x-rays of my knees. They said, this is the perfect bone structure of a normie, normal, healthy 14-year-old boy. We don't see why he has pain. So for 16 years, I ended up training with a tremendous amount of pain and I have two knee surgeries to, to, to show for it. Um, so when I started to figure out how to fix my own pain, I was like, I know that there has to be a couple million people couple other million people out there just like me that need this information. So when you talk about this being at age 18, looking through your book and how you just mentioned, there were tons of activities that you did, man. You were a son of a gun in terms of like getting yeah. after it. You were an athlete, you did football, you did jujitsu, you were a strength training coach. So of all those different activities, what seemed like it gave you some of the most challenges for your knees? I mean, it was everything. Um, and you know what? To be honest with you, the, the biggest challenge, the worst movement for my knees was sitting. I mean, if I sat on a bike three minutes, uh, I would want to black out because my knees hurt so bad. Um, if I was doing things like running or jumping or squatting, my knee would really only hurt when I contacted the ground. And even then, it would only maybe be a couple of times. Um, the real pain came the day after I was active, but, uh, you know, one of the best stories that I could probably put forth is, uh, I'm in, I'm in Hawaii, I'm driving, I'm in the backseat of somebody else's car driving to the, one of the Hawaii football games. And we got stuck in just a boatload of traffic. And I was sitting in the back seat for probably close to a solid hour. Um, I'm breaking out into a sweat. And everybody's kind of looking at me like, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm just, I'm sitting here trying to like rub my knees. Now I start to get like nauseated. Like I'm going to vomit in the car. Everything starts spinning and I'm just sitting there trying to like breathe like a Navy SEAL to make sure I don't pass out. I mean, honestly, my, my worst movement was, was sitting. It was just sitting with my legs at a 90 degree angle. It, uh, it created so much pain. It was unbelievable. Well, that's got to be tough because particularly most people will find that as their position of rest, right? Yeah. And so, you know, trying to be yeah. able to have a position of rest that really just is not one had to be incredibly tough. So, you know, you've trained tons of people, everything from like Navy SEAL to neurosurgeon to, you know, the common lay person to really professional athletes like the NFL players and such. Yeah. So of all these different people, which one was the hardest one to really kind of convince and treat? Um, well, the athletes are easy, right? Because they're looking for your professionalism. Um, it was the neurosurgeon. Definitely. You know, he probably contacted me two or three times making appointments and then canceling the appointments. 
And then he was like, okay, Chris, I really got to come and see you. And when he showed up, he was like, you know, we were doing all these tests and I got an MRI and then it was x-rays. And then he told me just like a laundry list of things that he was doing. And he goes, you know, we really thought that it was a labrum tear, but we can't find a tear in the labrum. And he goes, it's just, you know, going from my hip down into my knee. And he, he does a lot of running and exercise and, and karate. So he's like, you know, I can't do my kicks anymore because I can't lift my hip up and blah, blah, blah. So I just, I listened to him and really what it ended up being was a cross section between two muscles. His glute minimus was really, really tight, which just tightened up the dickens of his adductor. So you have this very strange pull on the femur. And when the brain senses that instability, it's going to be all bad. You're not going to even be able to use your legs. So when I got into those muscles and started pressing, you know, the eyes open up and he's just like, oh, oh, can't breathe. And he's like, what is that? And that's when he finally understood um, what, what I do and what pain for the most part in, in the body is about um, and how I treat it. So, yeah, let's kind of jump to that almost right away. Let's get to the, the real meat of the matter. And one of the questions that, you know, uh, really kind of popped up in my head and I think would be incredibly useful for our viewers to have an understanding of is, so what does one muscle with 600 pockets really mean? So if you look at a pair of pants, right, and you have two pockets in the front, two pockets in the back, nobody would say that those pockets are separate from the pants. Everybody would agree that the pants are, the pockets are part of the pants. So when we look at the human body, we can look at a whole bunch of muscles. You can look on an anatomy chart and see a whole bunch of muscles and everybody looks at them individually and says, oh, you know, it's, if, if it's the rectus femoris, like that's, that's the muscle, okay? Or if, uh, if I want to train my abs, I just, I got to do a lot of sit-ups. Like that's what's, that's the only thing that's working is my abdominals. So when people come in to see me, They'll come for back pain. They'll come for knee pain. They'll come for ankle pain or something going on with their calf. And uh, besides starting off with alignment, which I, I know that we'll get to a little bit later on, I'll be pressing somewhere in their hip to get rid of their back pain. And they're like, you know, I don't, I don't know if you heard me, but my back hurts. And I say, yeah, but the problem is in your hip. And the fascinating part of physiology these days is, is when we talk about fascia and this substance that just connects the entire body. So the body doesn't break alone. It's not like you lose a nut or a screw in a car and you just go buy another one and, and install it. Or if a carburetor breaks, you just replace the carburetor. When we talk about pain in the body, um, it can really be coming from anywhere. It primarily comes from misalignment, muscles then firing in aberrant patterns. But you really have to look at the body as being interconnected and not as being isolated. So when I say in my books that, you know, you got to look at it as a, a body of 600 pockets, but they're all connected. One will, will work against or for the other. And when you break one area, the other area is going to have to pick up slack. Or if one area gets really tight, you're going to be stealing energy from another area of the body forcing those muscles to work harder. So it becomes much more of a comprehensive um, look and treatment of pain rather than, oh, you know, I play basketball and my knee hurts. I should just go ice my knee. So that concept right there is revolutionary, right? And it continues to be, even though it should be more commonplace. So let me ask you this question. And one of the reasons why I'm really happy you use that neurosurgeon reference is not to bag on that guy. No, but absolutely for, not. Yeah. But, but, but for many doctors, including myself, that's not what we're taught. It's not the way we're taught. We're taught in discrete packets. Let's focus on this area. Let's focus on this area. Let's focus on this area. Right. And there are other specialists that and other alternative therapies that also kind of do their own dynamic. But why do you feel like or why do you think that it's not more commonplace that people can really be able to avail themselves of this kind of con conceptualization. Um, okay, so uh, the interviewee is going to be the interviewer. 
Um, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you want me to be? A, do you want me to be a hundred percent honest? Bring with it on. <laughs> I'm, I, heck yeah, hundred percent. This when is what people, we do. When when people come and see me, Doc, they my standard of care is one hour. Okay, my standard of care with them is one hour. In some cases, when people come up to see me from Miami and they got an hour, hour fifteen drive, they come to see me for two hours. Okay, mm-hmm. so in two hours. I can read one of my entire books to them, all right? In two hours, you can change somebody's life either psychologically or physiologically. When I was going to a tremendous amount of doctors and chiropractors and physical therapists, I was getting 10 to 15 minutes with these people. And I know that they were doing the best that they could, and I know that they wanted to help me, but... The standard of care when it comes to not just pain, but any type of disease in America um, is not sufficient for how complex the human body really is. That, that, that's that, that's my, my hardest, my, my cold hard truth answer right there because I've been through that system. I was going through that system for you know at least 10, 10 to 12 years bouncing from practitioner to practitioner to practitioner. And it was a 15 minute assessment followed by a prescription. It was 15 minutes of soft tissue work followed by a you know, three minute adjustment. And then here's your bill, you're out the door. Okay, so when people come to see me, um, I'm not checking their heart rate or, or having them stick out their tongue, but I talk to them about their lifestyle while I'm working with them. You know, like what kind of sleep are you getting? What kind of nutrition are you getting? Um, What are your habitual patterns during the day? Are you a bricklayer? You know, are you on your knees and carrying heavy, heavy stuff every single day? Um, What's your home life like? What are your relationships like? Um, I can't remember his name, Dr. Sorno, I believe has a book out about back pain. And he says, that when people come into my office, my first question to them is, how are you not being supported in your life? You see what I'm saying? So when people come in with to see me for pain, um, there are these things that we have in our brain called neurons. They create a chemical whenever we have an emotion that goes somewhere in the body. If you make me angry, I got this thing in my gut. My heart is racing. I could put my fist through a wall. I'm, you know, like that's the kind of where do you think all that energy goes after you calm down? Does it just disappear? It definitely doesn't. Those chemicals get stuck. They attach to certain areas in the body. And then we end up, if we don't, if we don't treat or care for that area, um, we end up creating little pockets of pain that over time get worse and worse and worse and manifest themselves as as something physical. Um, Like you said, you know, doctors are not being taught that type of material. Um, For the most part, for them, everything is a very quick fix through a a third party atmosphere, like a shot, uh, a a pill or a on, let's hope not, but eventually some type of surgery or something like that. So in the same respect, it makes it very hard because I get some clients where I look at them and I'm like, this is going to take 20 to 25 sessions to fix. Mm-hmm. Like, are you willing to make that type of financial time and, and time commitment? And they're coming from the thought of like, but I got a cortisone shot and my pain went away in 20 minutes. For for six, it went away for six weeks, but it went away in 20 minutes. Um, And, you know, by the grace of God, I probably keep about 99.8% of these people on my table coming in, working with me and whatnot. And then, you know, there are a couple people that I get that are just like, you know, which is, is ultimately even more confusing because they will see results not as quickly as they would like. So they go entertain other, other avenues and whatnot. But, um, you know, doctors, I, I have doctors in my family. I work with doctors. There's a, a doctor down here that refers his whole family and a lot of his patients and clients to me. 
I have nothing but admiration for doctors. Um, I wish that I could help them more. And I wish that they were able to pro provide a better standard of care because at the same time, my wife is a medical claims biller. And she tells me, she goes, babe, she's like, the, the doctor's hands are tied. Like the things that the system is doing to them, it's very hard for them to say, hey, I want to spend an hour with this person. They, they need that, that flow, that constant flow of people coming in and out. And she goes, it's, it's not the doctors, it's the system. So, you know, you, you got to understand that piece too. Yeah, I would say you guys are both being kind to us, uh, and I'm not here to bash docs because I'm I'm no, one of them, obviously. Not. Yeah. But I I think that um, but I, I think even if we were given that hour, the question is, would we look at that poor that person as kind of that whole, that right. aspect of like genes with multiple different pockets? Uh, and I, I think. You know, it's very easy to kind of focus on your area, but uh, referring to like if you're a knee guy, you deal with a knee or if you're a woman that deals with just neck pain, you know, cervical spine. And that's your specialty. You say, I'm going to focus on the cervical spine as opposed to it being a shoulder or another element that could be in, in an interplay. Not to say that we never consider it, but right. I, I would say that there are times where sometimes our focus becomes so myopic it doesn't allow for us to be able to look and address this. Before I kind of go further, one of the things I want to make sure is that our viewers are definitely uh, tuned in to all the different things that you've done. So you haven't just written a, a, a book about knees. Can you give us some insight about some of the other books that you have out there that might be of use to uh, other people? Um, I tried to cover the whole body as best as I could. So I have a head, neck, and shoulder pain Bible as well. Uh, I have a foot and ankle pain Bible, my back pain Bible, and then my knee pain Bible. And if you see back here, oops, sorry, that one right there, um, that's a combination of all four with a little bit more updated information. And it looks a lot more like a textbook rather than, uh, than a self-help book. Um, so they're, they're all my pride and joy. You know, I pour out um, as much information and knowledge as I can into every single one of them. Um, they all, all of the exercises work. Um, it just comes down to a matter the, the, the biggest problem is, do you work at the methods? And, and I pose that to every single person. And then the other problem that I have is people don't understand that when you're reversing disease, okay. And which a lot of times these injuries in the muscles, they, they are, they turn into a disease and start to spread to the other areas of the body. It's not like a cold or it's not like a flu. And in some ways you can even say that it is because a cold, you start off with, okay, my throat's a little bit sore, right? And then you cough mm -hmm. a little bit and now you're sneezing and then you're blowing your nose and then here come the aches and the pains. And then on the way out, it's like the cough is a little bit less and it's breaking up more and you're blowing your nose less and you're feeling more energetic. So there's kind of like this, this U-shaped curve to it, right? And when it comes to pain, everybody wants that ascending line. It's like, okay, I'm in pain right here and, and I just want to keep on getting better and better and better and better. And what I have to constantly help people understand is you will most likely get worse if you are doing it correctly, okay? We look for two things. If we're getting a little bit worse, that's actually a good thing because the only thing that you're trying to do with mobility or self-care is getting the pain to change. When you're getting the pain to change, whether it gets worse or whether it gets better or if it goes to a different part of the body, or if it just, if it stings a little bit more, or if it stings in a different way, like it, it's a little bit of a shock now rather than a hard like grab, as long as the pain is changing, you are on the right track. And I try to express that as best as I can in my books, but you have a person in pain trying to get better. They don't want to hear that. They, they want to be like, no, I just want the pain to go away. And that's one of the one of the more difficult avenues that pain has taken in not just America, but pretty much the entire world um, is that, we, you know, when we have pain, we just, we want to numb it or we want it to just go away. Like it's just, it's just going to going to disappear and, and not be a part of me anymore. Uh, and, and that that's, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, that's not the case. Sure. 
I, I would say in the context of like having this discussion, um, one of the things that I felt like when I was reading through your book was the point when I, you, after you've seen all these docs, you said, you know what, I'm going to tough it out for a number of years and just do what I can do for as long as I can do it for. And I think that's an element of mindset. And I think that, you know, you can go a couple different ways with that. But I know I've had patients that have seen that sixth, that seventh, that eighth doc. And and again, not knocking the doc, but just the healthcare system in general, uh, before they might find someone such as yourself, they sometimes are of the oak where that system has just beat them down and told them there's nothing wrong with you. You just yeah. got to figure it out and just and just go on. Yeah. And, and I think that 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 non-supportive element can be incredibly challenging for someone to say, how do you then dig yourself out of that hole or just kind of do that mind over matter? So one of the things I'd be really curious about is so in your own instance, you found a way to be able to kind of just keep trudging ahead. But I think you can be able to have some empathy with people who come to you. Oh, and yeah. Absolutely. Can you kind of explain how that impacts how you interact with people and how they're able to then be their own degree of um, agent for their own degree of improvement? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, in my case, it was just a tragic flaw, right? I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I train athletes. I love squatting. I love deadlifting. I love just picking up heavy things and throwing them around. Um, sandbag, kettlebells, dumbbells. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's in it's ingrained in me. Um, I don't know why. When I was eight years old, I, I saw a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger on the cover of Muscle and Fitness, and I said, I, I want to be that dude. I instantly went home. I just started lifting rocks and big tree trunks and twigs and things like that around and being like, okay, I'm going to lift. So my parents ended up buying me um, one of those weightlifting sets where you actually have to fill the, the plastic weights with cement. And, and then I started lifting those. So this was my profession. This is what I did and what I love to do. I was forced to find a way out of pain. And because I was, my career was physiology, okay, well, I can sit down and sift through the research and find out what works and what doesn't. But if you have a cashier working at CVS and their back is killing them every day because they're wearing really bad shoes and they're standing in a poor position, or maybe they're going through periods of carrying heavy boxes filled with merchandise to shelves that they then have to you know, fill and whatnot, that person isn't going to really have the education or the wherewithal to be like, you know what, let me go on PubMed and, and start sifting through um, tendinopathy, right? So my, my empathy comes from that respect of both being a common person, but somebody that was studying and understood and being educated in the realm of physiology. So when I get people that come in and I can tell that the pain and how many times have they've gone to doctors and everybody they've seen is just beating down on them. Like you can see it just, it, it's, like, it's like a shirt on the outside of their shirt, right? They come walking up my driveway or somewhere and they're just like, like man, like I really hope this works. Like it, everything's just killing me. And, you know, I, I've had wives, I've had husbands call me or, or text me and just be like, thank you for giving me my partner back. Like my husband was, he, he was just a, a downright dirty, like, you know, SOB because he was in so much pain every day and we didn't know how to help him. But you came along, you, you fixed his knee, you fixed his back. He's playing golf again. And like, this is the man that I married. So it's stuff like that, that, um, you know, allows me to, to have that empathetic point of view and just keep on waking up every day and doing what I'm doing. So, Chris, question for you. Um, if people feel like just being able to go through your books and doing it on their own is too much for them, where can they find more information or how can they connect with you if that's possible to be able to help them get to that point where they can start getting over the hump? Um, well, there, there's a couple of different ways. They can go to my website, influentialhealthsolutions.com and just send me an email. Uh, it would be chris at influentialhealthsolutions.com or if that's too long to uh, type into the, the email address, it would just be c.kadowski at gmail.com. Um, that, that's you know really the, the best way to go ahead and get a hold of me is through email. 
Um, my phone number is down there. That is my real phone number on my website. Um, if people call and I don't know the number, I typically don't answer. But if you text me, I will get right back to you. And uh, if I find out that it's somebody contacting me about pain, I will call that person back as well. Okay. So right now, I think you're located in Florida. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. We're about... South, South Florida, Lighthouse Point. I'm about uh, 15, 20 minutes north of Fort Lauderdale. Okay. So um, we're, I'm located in Indiana, South Bend. Home mm -hmm. of the, the Notre Dame yeah, man. Homers, right? So okay. let's say that I got people that say, you know what? I definitely want to talk with this guy. I definitely want to connect with this guy. Do you do virtual appointments? I do. Yeah, I typically, I, I do right now, I do more hands-on stuff, but I typically do about three to four virtual appointments a week. Okay. All right. So is there, uh, I know that I have some patients and I know I have some family members and some colleagues that are just like, you know what, man, this is nothing just than just massage. Right. Uh, that's all this really is. There's nothing that's really all that fancy about it. Can you kind of debunk that stat that statement and give some insight about why this isn't just massage? Sure. Um, it's better experienced than it is um, talked about. Okay. And everybody down here, they always ask me, they say, you know, a friend of mine has pain and I told them to go see you and they ask what you do. And it's just like, what do I tell them that, that you do? What do I tell them that you are? And people have said, I am a wizard. I'm a magician. People have said like, look, don't even care about that. Just go see him. And they're like, well, what does he do? What like, like massage and they're like well yeah it's it's kind of it's like that but it's definitely not a massage and they're like oh well, i've been to people like that before and some of the people come and get better and then some people don't contact me and i tell people there's one single difference between a magician and a wizard okay and a wizard works with alchemy so a wizard actually changes forms and structures of, of things, be it rocks, you know, turn a dog into a carrot or something like that, um, where a magician will just fool you. Okay. So the magician is usually doing this whole big dog and pony show talking about everything he or she knows, showing you pictures of everybody that that person treated. And then you get on the table or, you know, they're working on you and you're just like, I don't feel anything. Whereas I don't advertise. The only way that you know me is through somebody else. And I'm not going to, you're not going to come in and I'm not going to do this big dog and pony show. Um, all you are going to, all I'm going to do is, is point my wand and, and Shazam. And all of a sudden things start moving. And instantaneously within the first session, you start feeling 40, 50, 60, 70% better. Okay. So, that's the best way that I could characterize it. Everything is based off of alignment for the most part. And uh, once we get that alignment piece to fall in, the, the rest of your body just follows suit. And uh, it happens rather quickly. So um, I tell people I'm a structural therapist, you know, and the, the difference between a massage therapist and a structural therapist is let's say you own the Empire State Building and there's a moderate earthquake. Well, you have two people that you can call to check out the structure and function of your building. The janitor who has been there for 40 years, he knows every single room and office and nook and cranny of that building or a structural engineer. And I tell you, I go, the people, the massage therapists are kind of like the janitor. They'll, they'll know everything about your body, but they don't understand the intricacies of how the body actually works and functions as well as I do. So when you come to me, I'm going to see you in a much different light. Like I said, rather than just one single muscle, okay, it's just, it's this guy. That may be just a very small part of the piece. And what happens is a lot of people come to see me for one problem and we end up finding 12 more that the body has created in order to deal with it. Okay, does it matter the order 
in which you try to address the different muscles or can you just pick one and it'll all kind of work out? What's the commentary on how you kind of assess and evaluate? Okay, so um, that that's kind of a two-part question. Part one is it depends on what your issue is. A lot of times when we have a back problem or if we have a foot problem, it's usually a gigantic alignment issue, okay? If it's something like a knee, then it's more typically that we have a problem with an overworked muscle, okay? Or we have an, a dominant firing pattern on one side as opposed to the other. Um, case in point could be like an Uber driver or a delivery person. You're sitting down in the, in the vehicle and you're only using your right leg to switch from the gas to the brake. So all of a sudden that right hip and right leg become bound up because they're doing something habitually time after time after time after time again. Um, that's not going to be an alignment issue. I'm not going to have to, to align that person's shoulders in order to correct their hips. I can just go straight to the tissue, start to uncoil or unwind whatever is tightening up and, um, and, and hopefully get the person fixed. Okay. Well, we have an incoming question uh, from one of our viewers and we want to make sure that they get their questions addressed. And so it's a question that comes in from Anthony Giannilli who says, so I have bone on bone knee pain. What would you do for me and how would you go about treating me? Okay, well, that's a really great question. And unfortunately, in cases when you have bone on bone knee pain and there's no more cartilage left, there's not too much that I can do for you in order to eliminate your pain completely. Okay, um, you tear something or if you wear out something that God gave you, I am not going to be able to magically recreate it. One of the things that we can do, okay, is make sure that the tissue surrounding the joint is not referring pain into the knee. So it can be a combination of the two. In, in some cases, it's just the interior. There's no cartilage. It's bone on bone. You know, the, the, the outer coverings are rubbing against each other. That, that's going to be a lot of pain. But if it's the bone on bone combined with tissue that's really heavily compacted around the knee that's squeezing or compressing a lot of the nerves that are also leading into the knee, we can clear up that tissue and maybe eliminate 40 to 50, in some cases, up to 80% of the pain. Um, at least make it comfortable enough for you to go back to exercising or walking or just doing stuff around the house. Wow, that's incredible. Um, hearing that question, or rather that answer to that question, I, I think really uh, can be shaping for a lot of people because sometimes we have this uh, thought process that bone on bone means that I automatically have to convert to surgery, that there's right. no other alternative. Right. And I'm not sure that, well, actually I can pretty clearly state there are some of my patients that aren't asking for 100% relief. Really. They're just asking for something to figure out how they can then be able to do what's their why. How can they right. be able to you know, do their job or how can they be able to play with their grandkids or how can they be able to go for that run that lets them do the things that they want to do? So right. that's, that's that's really quite interesting. So let me ask you this. Um, the hip flexors frequently influence knee pain, do they not? Can you kind of give us, and I know it's a much more in-depth and detailed discussion than probably what we can get to in our, our current um, conversation, but can you give us some insight about how that sort of connects? Absolutely. So our hip flexors are very, very, very powerful. They're called the seat of our soul. Um, they're long, very special muscles, okay? They do a lot not only for the chakras of our body, which I'm not 100% familiar with. Um, I know that, that this isn't the type of program that we're going to start talking about, like energy centers and whatnot. But um, what the hip flexors do... Hey, 
hold on a minute now, Chris. <laughs> I mean, you don't know what we are. We might have a little bit of that here and there. Okay. But go ahead. And you tell us about what, what you got going. You, you give okay. Us dirt. So, so um, whenever we're looking at getting the hip flexors tight, okay, a couple things are going to happen. From an energy standpoint, we end up going into survival mode. Okay. So all of a sudden, when we start to go into survival mode, um, survival becomes a threat. So our body actually starts to compress in on top of itself. And the way that it does this is by tightening the hip flexors, pulling the hip into an anterior rotation, which ends up as the hip rotates forward, elongates the quadricep muscles, okay? So the quadricep muscles start getting pulled up towards the hip, okay? So when they get pulled up towards the hip and become even tighter, because now you have all this compression in these hip pockets in the front part of our thighs, what ends up happening is we start compressing and choking off a lot of the muscle tissue that's now leading down into the knee. So we get a double whammy, okay? In one respect, we get tight muscles, okay, that start to elongate. And in the same respect, we start to get a lot of compression from these hip flexors because they're still pulling, they're still being used. And if we're sitting a lot, you're going to exacerbate the problem. So when you go to try and bend your knee past where it habitually sits every single day, you're going to start to get knee pain for two reasons, compression in the muscles, by the nerves that then lead on into the patellar region, okay? And also because your brain is going to tell you that that tissue can no longer extend anymore. So when you have tissue that's at its terminal length and you're trying to extend it even more, it's at risk for a rupture. So the brain starts to say, whoa, 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 slow down, pain into the knee, and then what does everybody do? Everybody goes and treats the knee, treats the, treat the site of the pain, the symptom. Okay, my thing, like you said, is why is the knee in pain? Not how can we fix the knee? Why is the knee in pain? And that requires an assessment. What do you do every day? Oh, I sit behind a desk, man, I'm a day trader, 11 hours. I don't even get up to pee. It's, it's incredible. Okay, well... Let me check these hip flexors. I get in there and it feels like I'm I like like there's there's a football, like there's rawhide, like there's just leather in, in the iliacus, in the rectus femoris. Okay. Um, sometimes even getting into um so is major, so a minor. Um when you start there and start to open up those deep pockets of the hip and, and get the get the hip to actually turn back neutral you can almost uh, fix the, the knee pain overnight. All right. So I, I love what you're talking about. I love it. Now, I Thank know you. that there are a number of people that when we start talking anatomy, their eyes glaze over. Sure. And they're like, wait a minute. What? Rectus femoris? What? Iliacus? What? Gracilius? Sartorius? Yeah. All right. You got some pictures somewhere. And what I would say is within your book, you give – actual understanding about what we're targeting and why yeah right yeah. can you comment on your breakdown of how you look at the front knee the, the the side of the knee the inside of the knee the back of the knee and all those type of elements so people don't feel like this is too daunting the conversation might be man i gotta i gotta know a whole bunch of different things. i gotta be a strength coach i gotta know you know anatomy i gotta be a physiologist right. give us some insight about how you break it down for the layperson Okay, so in my books, I, I show people that there are roadmaps in order to successfully open up areas of the body. I think you touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, and more specifically, um, we're talking about trigger points. Okay, trigger points are little bundled up pieces of muscle tissue that are irritating a nerve. And with all these nerves being in the same area and being all bound up on each other, misery loves company. So what these guys do is they get together and they're all, they're all irritated and, and, and they don't like each other, but they can't move away from each other. So as the brain is trying to send signals 
through your movement to certain muscles to do certain things, when it gets to these guys, they send an accelerated message and they show how angry they are. And they say, I don't like all these other neurons being around me. And they just punch that signal through down into the knee. And you're like, ah, my knee hurts going downstairs or my knee hurts getting out of the car or doing a deep squat. So when we get into trigger points, we can fix a seemingly insurmountable problem very easily by getting that trigger point to release. And a lot of times, like I alluded to earlier, when people come in specifically for knee pain and I'm pressing into their um, hip flexors or I'm showing them how to get on a ball and dig into the, the vastus medialis, the inner portion of the thigh, they'll be you know, 18 inches away from their knee with the ball and they'll say, I feel that pain going right into my knee. And I say, that's your bogey, that, that's your gremlin. That's the guy that is creating your pain. So when I first started to learn about this stuff, I was like a kid with a hammer, everything was a nail. Okay, I'm pressing in here, pressing in there. Oh my gosh, like all this pain is just going into my knees, but I'm nowhere near my knee. I don't have to ice my knee. I don't have to ultrasound my knee. I'm not putting stem around my knee. Um, I'm not heating my knee or putting menthol on it or taking Advil. Like, how am I pressing into my muscle tissue and relieving the pain in my knee? So as I started to do that, my pain would go away for one to three days and then it would come back. So I'd get into the same areas and I was like, geez, man, like, all of this stuff came back, what gives? I would work on it again, I'd go exercise, the pain would come right back. And it took me the better part of five to six years to keep on working on myself and getting lucky enough to first release one area to then be like, oh, wait a minute, like now all of a sudden this area is releasing really easily. So over, you know, I've been doing this for a solid 15 years now, somewhere around that. Um, it just kept on evolving. And I started to realize like, in order to get rid of shoulder pain, you have to find out which muscles out of the 15 surrounding the shoulder are flared up. Okay, out of those, there's gonna be a sequence that you're gonna have to do in order to get rid of that the fastest. The lay person just banging on their muscles and opening them up will still be able to reduce their pain considerably maybe even get rid of it. And I tell people in my book, I go, if your pain is a 10 and you're using my principles, you could definitely get down to around a five or a four. If your pain's at a seven, you could get to a two or a three. If it's a four or a five right now, you can probably get rid of it completely. It depends on how long you've been ignoring it for, okay? Or not, not being able to fix it for. Okay, so to that end, you know, uh a lot of people use different types of instruments to help them get after that trigger point, right? There's the elements of using foam rollers. You comment a little bit in the book about the aspect of softballs versus lacrosse balls. And, you know, there's the aspect of using tennis balls for piriformis and all those type of things. What is there a certain instrument that you use and do you use it at different times? Is it a, it depends because it's variable from person to person. What would you say within reference to using a tool to be able to help you get to where you are hoping to be? So that's a part of the book too. Certain muscles are going to require different tools. And basically it comes down to the circumference of the tool in, in order to hit the aspect of the muscle that you're looking to open up. So some muscles will require something small like a lacrosse ball, okay? Other muscles will require a bigger circumference like a baseball or a softball, okay? Um, in some instances when I'm working with professional athletes or CrossFitters, I'll show them how to use a bar or a barbell actually in order to get rid of their pain and iron the muscle tissue out. In some cases, we need to track bones and put tendons back into place. So we'll use bands. Um, everything for the most part is explained in my book in, or in my books. And you're always going to be using a bunch of tools, which I mean, if you bought everything, it'd probably come out to maybe a hundred dollars. 
Um, and there's also a fantastic device called the SoRite that I've been using a lot in my practice too, that I think is around $49, $50 to help open up the psoas area, the iliacus, et cetera. Um, that can also be used on quite a few other muscles in order to open it up. So if, uh, if you're somebody that sits a lot, I would highly recommend buying a device like that and uh, using it every single day. Okay, so we got a number of other questions that are coming in, but I'm kind of going to paraphrase this a little bit. And I also want to kind of put a bit of a spin to this. As I listen to what it is that you're talking about and how you're able to impact people, to me, um, many traditional therapies, whether it's an injection, whether it's surgery, whether it's medication, they all have downsides to them. You know, if you try it, you have a... a, a pretty good possibility that you, if you don't get an effect, you might get a side effect that's associated with it. As I listen to some of the things that you're describing, if you don't get it, what are the deleterious or the harmful effects that would occur, if any? Um, can, you, can, can you say that? Can you tell me that question again? If you're talking about not getting the, the shots, et cetera? To me, so I'll paraphrase it. For okay. me, Taking the, the treatment option that you propose, it doesn't have a downside to it. Because to me, when you do traditional therapy, whether it's an injection, sometimes you might get an adverse reaction, you know, or, right. or you're going to fail. If you go after it from a surgical standpoint, one of the worst things is, is if you do the surgery and you don't get improvement, but you now have disrupted whatever tissue you had to cut through in order to get to it. Oh, yeah. Right? Sure. But if you were to try a therapy like this, are there any downsides to doing it? And if it doesn't work, what have you lost? Um, there are typically no downsides. The, the biggest thing that you're going to lose is time. And that time still is, I feel, better off spent learning your own body than sitting in a waiting room or fighting traffic in order to, to, to get to a doctor. Um, like we talked about only seeing you for 15 minutes and then having to go home empty handed or better yet, Worse yet, I'm sorry, going and getting the surgery and finding out like, oh man, this didn't work. Now I have a lot of rehab in order to reconnect this part of my body to, to my brain and get it to work correctly again. Um, you know, people are concerned about pressing on nerves or occluding blood vessels. And all I can say is that in 15 years of showing people how to do mobility and then also doing it on myself, my wife doing it, um, I've never had anything like that happened to me. I've never had anybody get a very negative side effect from doing mobility work with any of the bands, the balls, the bars, other than occasionally more pain before the pain starts to subside and get better. Okay. So incoming question from an audience that basically is posed as the following kind of summarized. So if you have bone on bone knee, uh, bone on bone uh, pain, or at least so it's believed that that's the case, uh, can you differentiate between the effectiveness of, effectiveness of this treatment for issues that are dealing with muscular inflammatory processes versus it having some issues with the actual bone rubbing? Okay. So Though those are both one and the same. If the bone is rubbing, you're going to get inflammation. And my, my position is always, why do you want to stop that inflammation? And I ask people, are you, four, are, are, are you smarter than 4 million years of evolution? Our body is inflaming for a reason, and that's to try and mitigate the damage that's being done. So we don't want to take pills in order to get rid of it. We don't want to ice it and chase it away and constrict everything, okay? Um, when you're looking at bone on bone, and obviously I'm not a doctor, but I, I have done a fair amount of research on this, and I've had other people come to me in my practice that have gotten this done, but you can look at other avenues like PRP. You can look at um, stem cell injections. You can look at stuff like, peptides with BPC-157. I don't know if those are 100% efficacious in growing back cartilage, um, but they have shown some promise in, in the literature. Um, you know, I'm sorry. It's just, it's a really 
really tough thing to deal with when you are eroding um, cartilage in a joint. Um, e even, even with the stuff that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very, very challenging to treat something like that in a permanent fashion because there is literally something that's supposed to be in your body that is now no longer there. You know, if you take if you take your stomach out of your body, if your stomach erodes, are you going to digest food very well? Probably not. You know, if the people that be, if the, if the scientists make a fake stomach and they insert it in you, is it going to work as good as the one you were born with? Who knows? But uh, when you are losing a critical aspect or cushioning aspect of a joint and it's eroding and we don't have a replacement for it, it's going to be very difficult from a muscular standpoint to eliminate everything permanently. Like I said before, we could possibly get rid of, you know, 40, 50, 60% and you could go back to exercising with a bare minimum of pain. Um, but I, I, I just have not found anything yet that will get rid of it permanently. Okay. So as we start coming up almost on that one hour mark, I want to make sure that people know exactly where they can be able to kind of reach out and find you. And as I understand it, we take a look. This is your website that yep. is, uh, <clears throat> yes, put the influential health solutions, right, dot com. And I think right down here in the bottom here, we have both where you're located as well as the phone number that you referenced, in addition to the email. So if people want to reach out and be able to get a hold of you, yep. um, they can be able to do that. And so I'll kind of leave this up on screen where we kind of talk a little bit more. Um, if people really want to be able to see the aspect of this video at a later point in time, one of the things that they can do is to pop to our YouTube channel that is Cutting Edge Pain Relief and be able to uh, acquire this at a later point in time. If they have someone that they care about or themselves, they want to reference different things that you've talked about, they can be able to see that. So, uh, Chris, let me ask you a question. I, I, in your book, you make mention of you try to hold off on going towards surgery if it's prudent and it's reasonable. Um, when do you make a decision, as you did for your NFL player that uh, commented during the foreword of your book, about having that person choose regenerative medicine versus saying, you know what, I think you really do need to see someone for traditional surgery? Okay, so, I mean, in the cases of a tear, Okay, ACL, MCL, PCL, LCL. Um, in the case of a torn meniscus, that obviously has to be shaved down if you still want to be active and it's hurting like a son of a gun. Those are really the only two instances where I tell people that you probably have to go and get some sort of surgery in order to correct that, that, that piece. I tell people it, as long as you've never had a pop, a a, a, a crack or a tear or anything like that, excuse me, if you manually mess something up in your body, you can manually fix it. So that just means like wear and tear. You know, you don't have to, I mean, some people will, right? But you don't have to. The only way to get your car washed is not by going to pay somebody to wash your car, okay? And I tell people, I go, if you maintain your car better than you maintain the muscles in your body, you're going to have a problem. It's just, that's what it's going to come down to. Um, there are a lot of people that get daunted. There are a lot of people that say, well, you know, I don't know anatomy, like you said earlier, or I'm intimidated by all this stuff. And it, it's a harsh answer, but my answer to those people is you're just not in enough pain. Um, I have people that come to me. They don't want to know how much I charge. They don't even care. They say, I have pain. My friend told me you can fix it. Where are you and how soon can you see me? Okay, so those are the type of people that are also more apt to, if I tell them, I want you to grab a stray cat and rub it up against your calf in order to get rid of that ankle pain, they will go and try to find a stray cat and do that. Okay, the, the thing that catapulted me to where I am today was my own pain. I got to a point where I broke down. I did a century ride, uh, a hundred mile bike ride around the island of Oahu. 
And I got home, I sat down with a couple of beers and I started watching football and my knees were throbbing. And I was like, it's been 16 years of this. I'm sick of it. You know, I'm, I'm by myself. My girlfriend just broke up with me. My, you know, I might as well have had a dog that left me too. And I started feeling sorry for myself and I, I started to cry. And then I'm like, nobody is going to help me. I need to help myself. So if you're watching this, that's the first step to helping yourself. Now, instead of being intimidated, what do we do? Let's take the second step. Let's go ahead and you don't have to purchase my book, but go and look on some videos on YouTube and see something that says how to get rid of knee pain. Okay, that's step number two. That wasn't hard. It didn't cost you anything. All right, well, I really don't have the tools that are in this book or in this video. Step number three, let me go on Amazon and buy a $3 lacrosse ball. Okay, one of the most modern medical inventions. People come here and I have lacrosse balls for sale. They're flying all over my house. $3 on the way out the door, go home, roll on your glute for the next half hour, okay, while you're watching Netflix. Doesn't really cost too much, a little bit of time here or there, okay? So all it is is taking a series of tiny steps in order to control your own health. And I tell people, I go, I'm in the service business. I am in the business to put myself out of business. I should be able to teach you how to take care of your pain so well that you never have to come back to me. And that's what I try to do with every single person I work on here or via the computer. And for some reason, my audience and my clientele keeps on growing bigger and bigger because I am trying my darndest to fix people and to help them help themselves. And rather than them leaving me and saying, hey, I no longer need Chris, they keep on coming back for more and more information. Okay. So as we start wrapping up here, I have a question which can be a little bit challenging, but I think it gives insight so we can have an understanding about where this is going. So let's say that we're taking a reflection on this three years from now. Mm -hmm. What has to have happened both professionally and personally for you to feel like things have gone in a successful manner? Um, that's, that's a really great question, but honestly, one that I've already answered probably like three, four years ago um, and has continually gotten better in probably like the last year or two. And it's kind of, it's, it's a three, three pronged approach. Number one, my business is now on autopilot. I don't have to worry about where my next customer is coming from my next client. Number two, um, I married one of the most amazing women that I've ever met in my life besides my mother. And then number three has been the birth of my daughter. So when you look at or when you talk about success, um, success to me is not just in my business because I am in the service-based business and everything is based off of a relationship. So if my relationship isn't good with my wife, it's not going to be that great with my clients. If my way of modeling or being a role model to my daughter is not successful, I'm not going to be a great role model also to my clients. So every single day I wake up and I try to be the best husband first, the best father second, and both of those help me to be the best practitioner um, when people come in to, to, to get help for their pain. So in my mind, I wake up every single day and I'm already the most successful person on the planet. Um, you know, do I aspire to open up a clinic with 20 or 40 other practitioners uh, underneath me? Maybe, maybe not. You know, the, the opportunity has come across my, my desk from a, a couple well-to-do people and I tell them, you know what? I'm just not ready to hang up my quality of care yet. Um, I'm not ready to pass the torch, I guess you could say. I still, I wake up and I'm just, I'm excited for every single day, for every single pe person that I work with. 
and then especially to, to do interviews like this with you. So, um, yeah, the question's already been answered, man, and, and that's the best that I can re-answer it for you. Well, wow, that's a heck of an answer. So, yeah, you. You, yeah. So, I, I, you know, at, at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, having perspective and knowing how it all kind of goes for what helps you know your why and helps you figure out your own drive and really makes it um, fruitful for you living your best life. I mean, I think how, how else could you do it better? Absolutely, man. When you're a service, when you're in the service um, industry and you're helping other people, you really have to have your stuff together, especially because, as you know, the work that you and I do, man, it's all energy work. And, and if you come to work because, you know, you your wife asked you to water the shrubs before you left and, you know, you're all in a fit and, and you're just you're venting to someone and they're looking at you like, hey, doc, I'm, I'm the one in pain here. <laughs> And you're like, no, you don't understand. Every day I, I'm leaving five minutes late because the shrubs. And it's like, no, you have to have your energy. Your energy has to be a baseline for other people to bounce their stuff off of, right? So when you're not at an even keel, when you're not in harmony, you're not going to be able to help other people very much, right? Indeed. So to, to me, that's the that, – that, that's the – that's the baseline. That's where everything starts is having my, 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 my office be one of the, the happiest places people visit every single day. It's phenomenal. So we want to wrap up uh, at this hour, Mark, and kind of uh, just reiterate, you know, it was a pleasure having you here. Uh, and just to kind of reiterate for people that didn't know, as we're talking, if, if you joined us late, this is Chris, who's the author of the Knee Pain Bible, a self-care guide to eliminating knee pain and returning to the moments you love. Um, hopefully you consider maybe coming back on again to talk about some of the other body parts. I know we have people with back pain and neck pain, and maybe that might be something you'd be open to in the future. Yeah, I absolutely would love to, man. Um, this has been a, a tremendous pleasure for me. I really appreciate everything that you're doing. And uh, next time we'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about fascia, about alignment, and uh, how things kind of get off kilter. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much for your time. You Thank have a great day. Thank you, doctor. Take All care. Right, bye.